Hello, everybody. This is Helen Turner at COHO and the HMO Awards. Um, today, I've got Maddie Norwich um, from Ethical Property Partners um, in uh, Northampton with us. And um, I really wanted to chat through with um, Maddie just to kind of find out a bit more about what Maddie does um, with property. So, of course, Maddie is uh, one of COHO's um, clients and she also won um, an award for the best uh, social housing um, investor at the HMO Awards recently as well. So hello Maddie. Hi, hi Helen. Welcome, thank you very much for doing this with me. No problem, my pleasure, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Fantastic, so um, first of all um, Let's find out a bit more about what you do in property. What is your portfolio like? Um, who is it for? That would be really nice to get started with. Yeah, sure. So um, my portfolio is really centered around the reason why I came into property, which was to do with addressing issues around homelessness, both rough sleeping homelessness and hidden homelessness. So uh, my portfolio is across Northamptonshire, where I run my property business, and it's mainly um, HMOs that each HMO is in partnership with a local charity where I support them to house their clients who would be disadvantaged in terms of access to housing or vulnerable um, in regular housing. And so really kind of those, that's kind of, you know, why I came into property. So what that looks like now is have a portfolio. I think it's of about 18 HMOs locally that I control all of them and own some of them. Um, so my husband and I own six and then the rest I manage for investors who um, have kind of bought into what I'm doing, whereby they own the property and they make a great return, uh, both socially and financially. And then more broadly looking across um, the UK at other opportunities to build a portfolio that supports clients who would be disadvantaged or vulnerable um, in access to housing. So we've just bought on 26 flats in Bedford over this last summer and a meeting with the council actually for th the council taking three of those studio flats today for um afghan and ukrainian refugees and so just looking you know where can we step in where perhaps some mm. landlords are shy to step in or other investors don't have an appetite and that leaves clients without access to safe and affordable housing that's yeah. kind of that's what my re raison d'etre as it were <laughs> that's, that's amazing so Maddie, can you tell us um a bit more about sort of your journey into property how did you get started and why did you choose this particular niche yeah sure so um I have to be perfectly honest with you and say that I'm not one of these property mad people who came into property for a love of property so um in my former careers um, I was a physiotherapist, so I worked in the care sector for a number of years. Then I was a stay-at-home mum for 10 years. Um, and then really to suit the my commitment to my kids, I went into teaching because I could teach while they were at school and still drop them off and pick them up. And so I found myself teaching in a further education college locally here in Northampton. And um, about, about five years into my teaching journey, I had a class of um, GCSE retake students and I'd not had GCSE students before I'd had A-level students and I had 21 um, GCSE students in my class and I was doing one to ones with them and about two thirds of the way through the year, I'm chasing them all for an assignment. I'm doing one to ones with them all. And it comes to light that seven out of 21 of those students didn't know where they were going to be sleeping that night. Right. And that just sat so uneasily with me. I couldn't believe it. You know, I had a mum of teenage kids at the time. You know, my sons were the age of the children that I was teaching. And as a parent, I just, I just sort of, you know, you have moments, don't you, where you just cut to the core about something. And so that was that really. And so I began to look for an opportunity to do something about that. And I didn't quite know where that would take me. I looked at working for different charities. Um, I just yeah it was just desperate to do something about it and did a conference i met um a guy who um who said to me oh well, i asked him what he did for a living and he said house homeless people and i was like 
you need to show me how to do that and so um that's frank flegg who i believe you met recently actually yeah. helen so yeah. he has been my uh mentor in terms of setting up a property business that is really so solely centered around housing homeless people yeah. and so i've had a that's why i'm with you mentioned i'm from Eth ethical property partners that's the franchise that i'm a part of that has supported and trained and equipped and believed in me to to set up and run the business that i have today yeah. yes of course i must mention that your business that you run um through is called stepping stones northampton isn't it yeah yeah that's right yeah yeah that's amazing to hear actually and um a story that uh, really probably resounds to a lot of the um you know uk situation at the moment so it's really nice to hear people who are actually um focused in this area to provide a solution um where it is uh, very different to the mainstream rental market um can you explain to me uh, a bit about how um dealing with charities and housing for social um tenants is different perhaps to those that are very much used to, you know, the traditional sort of um, HMOs for pro uh, professionals or student lets, how is that um, different for you? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think in terms of my experience of it, um, it's 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 not for the faint hearted, I would right. say. Um, so the charities and the organisations that I work with to partner on the properties, lots of them don't have any experience in housing. So you have to take a very walking alongside approach with them. Uh, quite a lot of them at the start have never had any housing before, particularly the local and regional ones. So it's a brand new field to them that they know if they had it, it would make a massive difference to the success mm -hmm. of their clients. But charities by very nature are quite cautious organisations. And mm -hmm. so, you know, they don't say yes on day one. Um, mm -hmm. It takes a bit of time, it took me a bit of time. It took me, I think when I started, it took me six months to actually secure my first order from a charity mm -hmm. for a house. And and obviously I had no credibility either. I couldn't say well, I've done this elsewhere. So it was finding mm -hmm. the first one. And then... And then very quickly, you know, once you start to get a reputation, more charities do come on board and also your experience, you know, grows massively. So I think the other, so that's, so that's probably one massive thing is you can't just set up a house and know you'll have a partner straight away. You have to be bringing on board charities at the same time as bringing on board properties and that takes time. And right. the, the other ways I think it differs significantly is you're sort of sitting in a market where you don't really fit in the sense that, you know, your local um, authority, your local enforcement officers are expecting to see very high end uh, quite glamorous HMOs for working professionals and that's kind of where my portfolio has to sit in terms of regulation but actually it doesn't really fit there you know we're looking at you know oftentimes housing people who've been on the street or who've been living in cars or garden sheds and so you know we need to give them an environment that's going to feel comfortable for them that's not so you know it, you can't if they don't fit in a very high-end environment they don't feel comfortable there they don't feel confident there mm -hmm. and so they won't you know they won't um they won't succeed and so we're really looking you know, we talk about um, if we won't, ha if I won't house somebody, nobody will. Um, mm. And so we, you know, we're trying to provide an environment that's fitting for the clients that we're working with. Um, and then, and obviously we're held to, you know, all of the regulations of HMO, which is great from a safety mm. point of view, it's no problem at all. But from a, you know, somebody's damaged a fire door or somebody's, mm. you know, we, we do, we do have problem, we do have um, ongoing issues with mm -hmm. bits of damage that are I guess you wouldn't get in a more professional HMO where people have got experience of being a tenant in other environments and they know how to look after a home. We're dealing with a client group who often don't know how to look after a home. And so we're working to support them really to grow in that. And I guess the other area that people think is very different is probably the finance side of it. So I imagine 
and I don't know this for sure, Helen, you probably know this better than me, but I imagine people think that it's impossible to make it work financially to do a social housing HMO. Um, and I, there are variations across the country, but um, really where I am in Northampton, um, I mean, we were making it work even, all of our room rates are pegged to the local housing allowance, I should say that. So okay. um, every single, the rent for the room is whatever housing benefit will pay for that client oh. and um and we claim that directly from housing benefit or we lease the property to the charity the charity claim it and the charity pay us there's two different ways of working and i guess lots of people would think that it's hard to make um make that work financially but we find it to be really successful particularly where the charities lease the properties because when a charity leases a property they can claim some money for the support that they're providing from the local authority so it's really it's a the thing I love about it is it just is a win in every direction. It's a win for the charity because they can house their clients and they can secure an income stream that means they can pay, pay their support workers. It's a win for the investor because typically my investors are making sort of ten percent upwards of ten percent return on their twenty five percent deposit. It's a win for me because I get to go to bed at night knowing that I've housed housing you know there's eighty five people tonight putting their head on a pillow who might be in a garden shed or on a park bench if I wasn't doing what I'm doing and so I, so I think it is a little bit different it's a it's a very cooperative approach because you're working with multiple partners all the time um and the finance also of it really do work which I think is the thing yeah. that people would feel shy about yeah. uh yeah those are probably the main the main quirks of it is it sits in a bit of an odd place in the industry for what it is but cool. it, it's none of those are insurmountable that's amazing. That's yeah, amazing. so there's a couple yeah, of things that I picked up from what you've said. So thank you very much for explaining that so thoroughly. First of all, um, you know, the market. Uh, so as much as there is demand for it, the market isn't necessarily readily, you know, available for you just to take, you know, to leverage it or to actually service it because you're having to put in, you know, besides, in addition to the normal complexities of running um, HMO or multiple occupancy households, you're also so having to develop your own relationships and actually, um, you know, persuade them to get, you know, have confidence, take confidence in working with you in order to, um, you know, um, make the the house available. I suppose um, what I'm saying is that uh, it's like you said, it's not for the faint hearted. It sounds like uh, you really do need to have a passion and a care for what you're actually doing. And that probably helps you kind of see the light at the end of the funnel, tunnel when you know things do get a bit tough as well when things perhaps will be moving a little bit slowly um to begin with but then in the end it sounds like you know when there is a win-win in all directions it must be very fulfilling yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. it is really and the second thing is um on the financial side um that you know what kind of i got from what you told me was that <clears throat> in a sense once you've got through that hurdle of finding a partner to work with and you definitely have tenants that they're going to be placing in there there is actually some sense of security if you you know perhaps if the charity is taking that for um i'm assuming on an annual basis um is that right yeah they typically take between three and five year leases three and five so. years, you see. yeah so there is that kind of security in terms of the income it is very regular um, you're not necessarily having to deal with chasing, um, you know, any of the rents because you're getting them in lump sums. Um, so there is, you know, for all the pain um, to setting it all up, it sounds like there is, you know, the advantage of having um, a little bit of uh, consistency moving forward where you can, um, you know, use that sort of extra time and brain space um, to go and pursue other projects yeah absolutely yeah that's definitely the case yeah definitely yeah amazing so um what um kind of investors uh would you say are there any sort of t typical sort of you know traits in the investors um that would be interested in working with you on these such projects yeah sure so i guess um 
Um, my typical investor is somebody who has between 40 and 60K of funds that they would like to invest in property, but they don't have the experience and the knowledge to kind of know where to start with that. Mm. Um, and I, I work very closely with my investors and I we call them armchair investors. Uh, you know, they can do it from their armchair at home. We just do all of the work for them. So quite often they're people who've got some savings or got a little bit of inheritance. They've got they've got. Um, they've got jobs where they're working full time they don't want to get into property but they would like to have that diversity of owning a buy to let and don't really know where to start and and um we do everything for them from that point forwards and then uh, we introduce them to all the um, professionals that they need to complete their purchase and i manage all of that for them and any refurbishment work all it costs them is their deposit and their mortgage application fee and we do everything else on their behalf so yeah that's the kind of person sort of 40 to 60k of funds and not very much time typically those are the people and then we do work with other people on finance investments so we recently raised three quarters of a million pounds to support us to purchase this portfolio in Bedford and we are able to offer between five and ten percent depending on the investor's appetite for um, return on on that portfolio so we do often have opportunities for finance investment and opportunities for uh capital investment of their own yeah wow yeah that sounds very thorough thank you very much for explaining that to me um so um i'd be really interested to hear about um your setup as a business in terms of the team and who does what who's in charge of what that would be really nice for us to find out is it all you <laughs> <laughs> um, it was all me until eight weeks ago when I bought on a PA. Um, so, so yeah, so I started my business in 2015 and it has been all me since then um, until about six weeks ago. And probably the tipping point for me was the bringing on of these 26 flats in Bedford, which is close enough for me to manage them, um, but far enough away and a large enough addition to what I was doing to really just tip the scale um, yeah. to needing a PA. So up until... Um, um, up until just after the HMO awards, it really was, it was just me and had been the whole time. Um, and in terms of kind of, well, I guess there's quite a bit of support in terms of systemization of things from ethical property partners, the partnership that I'm on. So I, I'm a great believer in systems and I'm a great believer. And if there's a set of instructions, just follow them and believe you'll get the result, it says. Yeah. And so I, there are lots that we have I've had a lot of support like that for every yeah. different part of my business from ethical property partners. But yeah, until eight weeks ago, it was just me. And now I have a PA and she's um officially start she was just doing a trial basis and now she's off trial and so she's working 16 hours a week for me and i, I can't tell you what a difference it's made it's hilarious because people have been saying to me for two years you definitely should get a pa and i'm like i'm fine like i'm really fine <laughs> <laughs> and now i've got a pa i'm like wow i should have done this sooner <laughs> Wait, why do you think you um you know left it so long to add to your team I think um, because so I, I had a bit of a rocky patch around 2018 when um, lots of my properties were I, they were what I call um, managed rather than lease. A managed property is where I interview every client. I do all the move-ins. I do the housing benefit applications. I do the eviction notices and all the rest of it. Uh, 2018, probably two thirds were managed and one third was leased. But then um, one of the major charity partners that I, and I was thinking at that point, I really need to get a PA. Um, but then one of the major charity partners who had five of those houses switched them over to leases. And so when they go to a lease, really all I'm doing is managing a single income payment once a month, paying the landlords and maintaining the HMO compliance. And so that became very achievable again. And then there was COVID and we all discovered that we could run our business on four hours a week when all of the family were in the house and there was other more important things to do. And so I think, you know, post COVID ramping up and building again, actually growing the portfolio thinking, OK, no, definitely now is the right time to employ somebody. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And um, so. Um, I think that the reason why I'm so interested in, you know, growing the team, I think a lot of um, investors or landlords and managers, you know, when they first start out, it's all very much, you know, themselves, it's all 
very much you know the relationships with them they know the business inside out they're still shaping actually when you're talking about systems mm -hmm. you know you're still shaping you know how you want to do things efficiently um and then of course you know um it's a it's um you know really nice to hear that you came on you found coho you came on to coho before um you added to the team and um i'm hoping that that made things a lot easier for you to kind of share workload as well once you've got a system a formal system in the form of a platform in place to to, to do that so um i'd really love to find out talking about coho actually um how did you find coho how did you come across coho yeah so a friend of mine on ethical property partners mentioned it to me um, and she was exploring it and we'd been using a system that had been set up by a PA who used to work for headquarters on ethical property partners and it's an access database I don't know if you've ever used Ooh, access yeah. databases Ooh, but they're I'm like a nightmare for a long time. yeah I think yeah. about 15 years <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and so it, this yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm a, I'm a relatively detailed person, but like if you just type one thing incorrect in a, in a, in an access database, reports don't recognize it, and so you know you yeah. mistype a date rather than 2018, you're about 2028, and you can never find that thing again. It's just disappeared off the face of the sure. earth, and if that's a payment that you should have charged to a landlord or something like that, then you just just lost it. And so I found that system really difficult to work with and actually i had a lady who, do, who supported me a bit in 2017 to just try and um get a bit better on that system and she was like you know the first opportunity you get to move away from this you should so when amanda my friend mentioned coho i was like oh, well, i'll go and give it a bit of a look see and i think um it was the day we went for our covid vaccination jabs actually i think it was either you or claire gave me a call i'd literally just had my covid jab and you were like oh you've signed up for coho how are you getting on with it? And I was, and to be honest, I'd just done the demo. I hadn't done very much else at that point. And I was like, yeah, I really should, you know, I really should try and use this. And what I'd looked at meant that I'd realized that it would be really intuitive. I've just find Coho super intuitive. I honestly think it's a management system for the, the now generation because mm. it's just very intuitive to use. Mm. And so, um, so I did put some properties on it and then and then I just thought crumbs it's going to take a lot of time and also it's like it's orange at the start and I'm a really color sensitive person so if it's not green it makes me really sad um, yeah. and I know that's terribly sad but I was like I need to be able to see. if I could change the color I'd probably do more on this because I just feel bad because it's not green um but then when I brought my so then I you know I did I dabbled in it um and then when I brought my PA on board Francis um I introduced her to Coho on day one of her working for me I was like I think this would really transform how we run our business it could be I think it could be really easy she spent half a day on it she was like I love it it's the best thing oh, ever and so you. she's she's also found it you know really really intuitive and now we've got and so I think I pretty much had most of my portfolio on there before, although Francis coming on board coincided with his 26 flats from Bedford coming on board. I, I love the flexibility. So, um, so many systems, when you don't quite fit the box, they can't adapt for you. But one of the things that I've really found with Coho is like, you know, we've got five blocks of flats in Bedford and I contacted yep. the team on Discord where the support is great and just said, how shall we list these? And within two hours, I've got an answer or we'll list them as HMO, you list them as single properties with five flats rather than, yeah. and I just, I've just found, um, the team to be incredibly responsive to any hiccup that we've had along the way. And so you don't, you, you know, you, you've got, you know, where to go for support. You're not on your own. Yeah. You know, you're going to get an answer quickly. I think with lots of systems, you know, you're left Googling it and searching YouTube for videos and you just waste hours trying to find an answer, which no business owner has out those hours to waste, do they? So, um, yeah, so we've just found it very, very intuitive, very natural. That's amazing. Well, I'd really love to find out, you know, which, uh, what do you, what sources, which features do you love using Coho um, for? What, what are the most, you know, important parts of Coho for you? 
Yeah, so I think for me, um, when I first spoke to you about Coho, you said to me that there was going to be a finance update. And to be honest, I was kind of waiting for that to go all in because that was oh. because I really wanted to get away from my access database. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that was one of my main motivations for looking for something else was to find a system that could manage the finances of it better, both in terms of my own portfolio and in terms of my landlords, because what I'd been doing with my access database was just running my landlord lords not running my own so my own were just in my um accounts so or just running accounts for those and so nowhere to manage the kind of the tenancy management side of it so i think for me um i came on board wanting a finance system um but now that i'm using it i'm really loving um the tenancy management side of it as well i haven't at present got many tenants linked to coho because we've bought tenanted properties and to transition somebody who's used to using whatsapp for 13 years across to coho and quite a lot of older clients in some of those flats but as new tenants are coming on board where we are um using coho to communicate with them so i think yeah it was it was the fact that there was going to be a finance pack that really drew yeah. me now that I'm in it's also the tenancy management stuff um and so moving using, forwards I think yeah so are you using um the onboarding process with your own then no, no. Not the onboarding process communication so with your own um property uh your own part of the uh, portfolio um tenant communication for maintenance are you using that that's what we're going to get into as we bring on board new tenants is yeah. absolutely to getting them communicating through coho sure. yeah yeah and then with the existing tenants like you said you know with the new tenants there will be a turnaround eventually and when that happens it will just naturally fall into coho as you get used to using yeah. it as well and then yeah. um yeah and uh, just to i don't think we've mentioned yet um you do have almost 100 tenants that you're dealing with all together in your portfolio uh, yeah, I would think it's probably 130, something like oh, that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, you're obviously growing at a faster pace um, than I'd realised. So, yeah, that's amazing. And then um, I think, you know, when I did last catch up with you, Maddie, um, I was really happy to hear that you'd um, found the update on finances, which we hadn't, to be fair, promoted, um, you know, very heavily. Uh, we wanted our existing customers to kind of pick it up and see if they could use it and get some feedback. And you were one of those that, you know, I just found out, I didn't know, but I just found out that you um, <laughs> discovered the financial features. Could you describe what it actually does for you and how it's helpful? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we so we completed our first month end on it last month, which has yeah. has been a, a tedious access database job up until the last month. And um, so what that meant for us was that we could input all of the rents that we've received, input any costs or finances that our landlords had incurred or that we'd incurred across our portfolio. And we could generate a statement that, that we could then send out to every landlord and say, this is the payment that you've received minus our fee and minus any of your costs for the month. And that was just, it was the easiest month then that I've ever done, bearing in mind that I've been using my old system for like seven years. I was so grateful. And um, so we use the we use, the, we use settlement state we use settlement statements for that. Um and that was the priority for us was to get that in place for our landlords so it was great because we sent those statements out to our landlords and asked them you know if they found that this is a more you know a more user-friendly statement and got unanimous feedback from our statement from our landlords about the settlement statements that we meant that, that they were much easier for them to use they made much more sense and there was much less you know irrelevant data on there that nobody wanted wow. or needed so yeah yeah it's um, really great feedback so pleased to hear that. Um, so I think what you touched on before, you've got a mixed portfolio, some of that are owned by yourself and then some of them, you know, with landlords that you're or other um, investors that you're dealing with. And I think um, one of the things that you touched on was just, you know, how easy it was to be able to manage the, diff the various parts of your portfolio within the financial feature of Coho. So, you know, with the um, owned stuff, you know, you don't necessarily have management fees and so forth that need to come out. And then with the um, investors portfolio, then obviously your how many different um, settlement statements did you have to run? 
Um, it would have been 12 settlement statements. Yeah. I yeah. can imagine that if it was a manual job, then that's you know, quite a repetitive task, but also like you mentioned before about, you know, having typing in the, uh, the wrong number and not being able to see where the mistake might be, um, that is all completely alleviated, isn't it, from yeah. within Coho? Because yeah. it's so easy to see where everything is and then numbers yeah. being automatically pulled into the settlement statement. So, um, yeah. yeah, would you say how much, you know, let's try and quantify that, you know, um, how many hours do you think that saved you by using Coho to do your settlement end month what? statement? Uh, it's, it's probably four or five hours, maybe. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's great to hear. Yeah. OK, um, so thank you so much um, for explaining all of that, Maddie. Now, um, I know that you're always open to um, having conversations with potential investors who are interested in investing in social housing um, properties. Now, um, what's the best way to kind of get in touch with you, Maddie, if somebody was listening and thought, mm, I'd really like to have a conversation with you? Yeah, sure. So um, you can find my local business on Facebook. So I'm Stepping Stones Northampton Limited uh, with a picture of my face. Um, <laughs> that's me, fairly, makes it fairly recognisable. And and, and Don's, um, I'm not on very many social medias, but my business Facebook page is Stepping Stones Northampton oh. Limited. If you're on Coho, you can find me on Discord. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. That's a really good point. OK, that's amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed your chat and, you know, it's been really enlightening to speak speak to um, a Coho user who uses Coho slightly differently, but still, um, you know, finding it um, make a lot of impact to their, the operational side of their business. So thank you so much for your time, Adi, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up again soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you very much. And a pleasure to be part of Coho's journey as it grows and develops. I'm excited for you. Thank you, Maddie.